So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to uh, today's event that is off our usual calendar. Um, I'm Farina Mir. I'm director of the Center for South Asian Studies. I'd like to welcome you. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to make a few announcements. So um, one announcement that I always make is to ask you to please kindly fill out the survey on your seat before you leave this afternoon, which has a correlation to our federal funding. So please take an opportunity to do that. A uh, second announcement is that on Friday the 22nd at the end of this week, uh, Radhika Parameshwaran of Indiana University will give a lecture here at 4 o'clock entitled Exfoliating Colorism, Contestations, Comedy, and Critique in India's Transnational Media Field. This event is coordinated or co-sponsored by the LSA theme semester, so I hope you'll all be able to join us for that. The following day, February 23rd, I'm very pleased to announce that an exhibition will be opening at our own University of Michigan Museum of Art entitled Buddhist Thangkas and Treasures, the Walter Colts Collection. Um, our own Carla Sinopoli has played a major role in this exhibition, and we hope that you'll all be able to attend. It's opening this Saturday, and it will be on actually through early June. So you can um, certainly take your time to get over there, but I did want to bring it to your attention. Now, let me turn to today's lecture, The Streets Are Rising by Niza Khan. We're very fortunate to have Niza with us today. Her visit to U of M has been made possible by the generosity of a number of institutions, departments, and individuals. These include our colleague, Karen Zitzowitz, Zitzowitz at Michigan State University, and here at Michigan, the School of Art and Design, the U of M Museum of Art, and the Department of the History of Art. My thanks to each of them for their support. Naiza Khan comes to us from Karachi, Pakistan, where she has been based for the past 22 years. A native of Pakistan, she was trained at the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art at Oxford University and the Wimbledon School of Art. From these beginnings, she quickly established herself in the art world and from 1995 has had a series of solo exhibitions that span the globe, from Hong Kong to Bombay to Karachi, Dubai, and London. She has also ex exhibited her work in a number of very significant group exhibitions. Perhaps best known to us here is the Hanging Fire Contemporary Art from Pakistan exhibition at the Asia Society in New York in 2009, a show that was very, very well received. Niza is a person of many talents, and in addition to being an artist and a teacher, she teaches in the Department of Visual Studies at the University of Karachi. She is also a curator. Most ambitious of her curatorial projects, perhaps, was the exhibition, The Rising Tide, New Directions in Art from Pakistan, at the Mohata Palace Museum in Karachi, which brought together the work of some 43 artists, was it? 42 artists in 2010. Again, an exhibition that was very well received in critical forums. Niza has come to Michigan to open the exhibition entitled Niza Khan, Karachi Elegies, at the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum at Michigan State University. The exhibition opens to the public on Friday the 22nd. The exhibition will also see the release of a monograph on Niza's uh, work, co-published by Art Asia Pacif Pacific and the Broad Museum. The monograph covers the entirety of her career up to the most recent, up to her most recent and ongoing work, the Manura Archive. Before turning over the floor, let me invoke the words of my friend and colleague, Iftikhar Dadi who has written eloquently, used this image on the cover of his book, who has written eloquently about Niza's work in his Modernism and the Art of Muslim South Asia, which I know that some of you have had the opportunity to read and some will do so soon. Dadi writes, and I quote, for over a decade, Niza Khan has developed her practice through a persistent formal and thematic meditation on the female body she has charted an exemplary, independent path among the shifting currents of contemporary Pakistani art, producing an extended body of work 
exploring the sensuality of the female body, but also its weight, its opacity, and its recalcitrance in relation to the social order." End quote. Today, we are lucky to hear about a new body of work, this on the urban and public landscape of Karachi and Menorah Island specifically. Please join me in welcoming Naiza Khan. Thank you very much, Farina. That's a wonderful introduction. I hope I live up to all these um, things that you've said. Um, I'd like to thank um, Ann Arbor and Farina Mir for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure. I, um, um, I'm here for a very short time, so it's wonderful to share this uh, process with everyone here. Um, I realized as I was chatting to Farina over lunch that um, I'm, I'd, I'd only put in images of very recent work. So just uh, to give you a sense of what I've been doing over the last uh, 20 years before this um, project in Manora started, I thought I'd just include a few images of that work. But I'm not really going to talk about it because I think um, there's... Um, there's not enough time for that. So, um, well, um, the introduction, uh, in the introduction, if the Khar's um, words are sort of there to encapsulate a little bit of what I've been doing. And I think that um, it's useful to show this work because um, the body, the female body, has really been central to my concerns um, over the last 20 plus years. And uh, really, it has been important in terms of um, not only the fact that I've been working with the nude, um, which um, becomes a political kind of statement in the context that I'm working in. Um, and that is not the reason why I work with the body. Um, but it has also been a very personal sort of statement of ideas. Um, that that um, are carried by these uh, drawings. Uh, for about a decade, I worked with drawing, quite specifically teaching drawing, as well as uh, making my work within that space. So um, drawing as a process, as a medium, was a very important catalyst for developing ideas and developing the conceptual concerns that I had. Um, and um, these are some of the Perhaps uh, some, some are more studio-based drawings with the model, a model that I've worked with for over 20 years. And some of them are drawings from memory, perhaps. So uh, there's a mixture of both. Um, really, the body became a site for creating and contesting a kind of space which um, one occupies. Um, most of the work that you see was done within the studio space. But I think that it has um, a sort of uh, indirect reference to the public space as well, in some ways. Um, and over a period of time, I think that um, in terms of the way that I was articulating my ideas, it wasn't just the body, but the attire that became a form of um, expression where um, more um, explicit ideas could be addressed. Um, and, and the word transgression comes in here to some extent, but just in the way that lingerie has a certain um, statement to make and how attire that you wear can become a way to express multiple personas. So um, in the last couple of years before uh, engaging with the island in Manora, I was really working on these um, series of drawings which um, also became objects. So there was an interesting dialogue between the way that um, an object was, um, a sculptural object was, was fabricated, and then it became part of a drawing. And then the drawing uh, became more, um, I would say, um, open, and, um, and, and it would be a way to envision the next object that I would make. So, in a sense, uh, that dialogue was very important uh, between the actual making of the work and the conceptualization of it. So these, um, some of these pieces you will see at the Broad Museum. 
um, it's it's an exhibition that's going to be about the last five years of my work. So um, Karen, who's curated the show, has um, has kind of taken um, the armor works and then taken on what I've been doing in the last three, four years. And there's a very interesting dialogue about the shift, I suppose, which I'm also trying to grasp and understand. So um, the last uh, few images um, really talk about the way that I was thinking about the sculpture work and the idea of performance or being able to sort of <clears throat> use the sculpture in a more fluid way. So the armor works began to get softer in a sense. So the steel turned um, was mixed with uh, leather and uh, feathers and suede. So a lot of the objects began to shift into a more pliable form, as well as the muslin, um, which is on the right hand side of this image. So um, I think this image, in a sense, is a turning point for me. Um, these armor works were placed um, on the seafront in Karachi, uh, very close to the Indus Valley School of Art, where I taught uh, for many years. And um, I think uh, at the time that this was taken, this photograph was shot by Arif Mahmood, um, I didn't realize how important the landscape would be in coming years in, in terms of the work that I was about to embark on. Um, and I think that um, it really talked about the future of where I was going to shift and change my practice or develop it. Um, and, and so this, this image is interesting. I'll show you subsequent images I took of this particular area of land. Um, the, the image shows the beach, which actually, with a low tide, and all of the um, of the, the the white that you see are, is actually garbage bags that has that have probably uh, come in with the with the high tide and then embedded themselves on the on the beachfront. So um, so this image is quite important and and it it's a good entry point into what I'd like to talk about next. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Another small project, well, important project, in fact, um, around 2003 was, was the Henna Hands, which if the Khar, in fact, talks about in quite a lot of detail in his book. So I won't really go into this, but um, it's nice to show these images so that you can identify with, with the images. It was an attempt, really, for me to take the body out into the public space. I had been drawing and um, working with, with the female nude for many years, and it was always... Uh, I always heard people say, but you know, you can't really take this work out. You can't show it. Um, although a lot of the drawings and paintings were shown in, in uh, private galleries. But uh, really, I was testing the waters. It was a, a very personal attempt to test the waters and see how would people respond to the image of a body um, alongside the many other images that you see on the street, um, public uh, calls for marches, um, graffiti, public, uh, you know, outpouring. I mean, the the wall chalkings in Karachi are a separate topic of for a lecture because so much has been written about and and you know discussed um, about that whole phenomenon and how it becomes an outpouring of um, of people's desires, political desires, personal desires, out onto the walls of the city. So my um, henna. Uh, imprinted um, female bodies also became part of that visual landscape and um, were transformed by people and censored somewhat uh, in that process. So I will not um, really talk about that anymore, but go into what I'm, um, what I'm currently engaged with. Um, I thought about the title, The Streets Are Rising, and I thought I, I should really... Um, perhaps have not had that title because it sort of, it sort of uh, generates a different tempo of, for my talk. But um, perhaps towards the end, we, we will touch on that because that's the title of the last and most recent oil painting that I finished. Um, 
just some images to familiarize you with what what the kind of terrain that I'm looking at um, and the research that that have that has come about. Um, I started visiting Menora Island in 2007, and I didn't really go to the island with a specific intention to make work or to create some body of research. I really went to the island to get away from the city, uh, like so many people do. Um, there are about 7,000 visitors to Menora Island every weekend. Uh, the island itself is populated with about 3,000 residents, most of whom are employees of the Karachi Port Trust, the KPT, and the Navy. And there's, of course, a civilian, a small civilian population. But this is the, um, this is the um, a view of the island during the monsoon, uh, which was shot in September last year, um, with, with, which shows the, the sort of um, uh, the, 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 the seafront towards the um, Indian Ocean. And um, it also has, um, in the skyline, you can see the lighthouse in the distance. And in the center far uh, horizon, you can see the, um, the Talpur Fort, which is now a Navy installation. So the Talpur Fort dates back to about um, sort of mid 18th century, built by the Mir, the Talpur Mirs, the, the sort of uh, ruling elite of Sindh. And, um, and, and you have the temple in the near uh, part of the, the left side of this image, um, the Sri Varundev Mandir. And so the island is an interesting um, mix of, um, I, I'm going to just take you through these images and, and you can see the journey across from the mainland, which is about a 15 minute journey by boat um, on a taxi boat. And these images are shot through the porthole of a Navy tugboat. Um, I would often go take a Navy tugboat because I became quite friendly with the Naval Commodore and they were very kind to give me transport from the Kamari port to the island. Uh, the island itself has a civilian pier, and then it has a KPT pier, and then it has a Navy pier. And depending on what kind of transport you take, you get off at a different pier, and it brings you to a slightly different part of the island. So these images are interesting, and um, I, I like the uh, the way that the, the, the landscape is framed. Um, um, and I started to play around with these uh, sort of spaces, these openings in my work. So both of these images are reconstructed images of um, the different sort of uh, vistas that you you can gain when you're actually on the island. So um, <coughs> the the, um, the uh, menorah, in a sense, is um, really an extension of the city, um, but it's also counterbalance to the city. Uh, which is uh, quite chaotic. Karachi has a population of over 18 million people, and I think they're trying to do a census now after many years, but we'll, we don't really know the exact population of the city because it's constantly expanding with people coming in from the north of the country. Um, with the floods in 2010, um, thousands of um, flood refugees came in. I mean, 20 million people were displaced during the floods across the whole country. But in Sindh alone, uh, thousands of refugees came into Karachi. So these refugees, a lot of them have settled in the city, and they're not going to move back um, because there's nothing to move back to. Um, so really, the population of the city is constantly growing. And in a sense, Manora is like a quiet anchor to this um, chaos. Um, the, um, the ownership of the land, uh, this is an image actually um, of the port um, and uh, the size of vessels that come into the port. So <coughs> Manora itself has a lot of different stakeholders. You have a small civilian population. You also have um, bureaucratic lodges. It's a naval base. And um, really, the real identity of its citizens is still really an open question. But there's an interesting coexistence between the civilian and the naval establishment side by side, which I find constantly more and more interesting and challenging to negotiate. Um, <clears throat> the um, okay, this is just an image I put in last night, which was um, the new public toilets by the Cantonment Board, which is what greets you when you get off the pier. And it's quite interesting because in Urdu it says cantonment board, um, um, 
public toilet, but on one side it's the khawatin, the women, and the other side are the male toilets on the right. Um, I found these quite sculptural. As a visual artist, I think I, I responded to this really as a sculpture piece and wish that I could have made these public toilets. Um, I, I was actually invited by the Commodore to make public toilets on the beach um, when he found out that I was visiting the island for the for a couple of years. Uh, you know, the first thing he asked me to do, in fact, in the first meeting was, Niza, can you and your friends design the public toilets on the beach? And we'll get the Chinese to um, to pay for it. <laughs> because uh, th there's, there's a lot of um, work going on. There, there's an interesting um, development because the deep sea port is now expanding. The new terminals that are being built, one pier is being built from Menorah Island itself. So um, Menorah is, is quite a sort of multi, it was a very multi-religious space. And I think, um, in a sense, um, I constantly find comparisons with Menorah to the, isle, to, to the city of Karachi, because Karachi itself has many um, uh, multi-religious sites of worship. Um, Menorah has um, the Sri Varun Dev Mandir, which is on the right-hand side of this image. Um, and on and, and it has two gurdwaras, it has two churches, um, it has a Sufi shrine, uh, and, and many mosques. So um, I've, I've really just been wandering around the island for these last few years. And as I said in the beginning, I didn't really uh, set out to create a project. I didn't set out to make work. I was very happily working with, with the armor works and really expanding on that sort of in that in that way, um, but after about a year or so, I I realized that there's something very interesting happening on the island, and it was it was the um, uh, well multiple things happening. The first thing was the way that um, um, the buildings and and the sort of um, the ruins. Um, perhaps I should go forward a little bit. This is this is an image of um, the the mandir, which is functional, the Sri Varundev Mandir. Uh, Krishan, who is the keeper of the mandir. Um, and this is an image of the Gurdwara, um, which is sort of tucked away in a residential area on the island. And another image of the uh, the academy, the naval academy, which in which you know you have about three hundred naval cadets that train. so the 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 architecture is is it, the the difference in the different kinds of buildings that exist on the island. You can see this in relationship to these buildings, and um, and so um, the the, um, the the one of the things that that uh, I realized was the way that some of the uh, KPT blocks, these are two of them, were being demolished and marked for demolition. So these were buildings from the 1960s, um, and a lot of the KPT workers had been given a golden handshake. Menorah was going to be turned into a sort of Dubai-like seven-star resort, uh, which which didn't happen, luckily, because of the um, uh, financial crash and because the Sindh government refused to sell the land um, finally in the end. But really, there were a lot of destabilizing factors, including the insurgency in the north of Pakistan. Uh, so people probably questioned whether there'll be enough tourists coming in um, for these resorts. So, um, you know, it, uh, um, Menorah is kind of in a strange way quite empty in some ways. Um, and at the same time, you have these buildings lying vacant and falling into ruins. Um, and I find the new ruins more bleak than the, than the, the historical ruins, I suppose. On the left is the Menorah Observatory, built in uh, 1898, and the lighthouse and St. Paul's Church, all which are functional, and except the observatory, and the Sri Varundev Mandir. So um, even documenting the buildings over these last four or five years, I've seen a change in the, in the kind of way that um, you know, these buildings are, are, are slowly disappearing, actually, and being demolished. But also, more than that, I was interested in the social relations of, of this community and, and the impact of um, this changing physical space on on the on the on the people living on the island. This is um, another uh, KPT building, uh, which is actually being refurbished. And uh, the right hand side, there's a there's a uh, a date, 1947, uh, 
so the the building uh, on the right was was um, was completed in 1947. Um, this gentleman walking his walking somebody's dog was Xavier de Souza, um, who's probably one of the few. In fact, he doesn't live on the island. His sister does. Um, you know, very very small Portuguese Christian community. Um, but I'm sure there must have been must have been um, many more. Um, I keep finding interesting facts about the island. Every time I go, I, I find out something new. Um, so really, um, the mapping or I, the, the kind of the way that I feel that I I found a way to sort of map this place, the cumulative process of mapping the island, has really evolved in a very intuitive kind of way. So through random conversations, um, drawings, um, uh, also various legends and um, and 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 really sort of looking at the unscripted linkages between all of these different um, ways of, of 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 finding the space. Um, this this image uh, brings me back to the one that I showed you earlier on of the Karachi beach with my armor work, and this is pretty much the same spot, um, except it's taken four years on, five years in fact. So this is the second deep sea terminal that's coming out from this um, mainland of Karachi. And it sort of sweeps towards the right. And Manora is just on the right-hand side of this image, but not you can't really see it in this, uh, in this photograph. So um, I mean, the building of terrain, the way that the land is expanding, the way that the, you know, the land is being reclaimed and, and um, is a constant, um, there's this constant engine which keeps driving the expansion of the city, not only in towards the sea, the mangroves that are, um, that, 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 that are disappearing, but also the north of the city out into the desert. Um, so this image again becomes a way for me to uh, experience, uh, for, for, for me to show you how, how, um, how, how this uh, process of transformation is really rapidly changing the, um, the visual space of the city. Um, these are pylons which are um, stacked um, by the Navy on the island. And again, they kind of, um, they kind of represent for me um, uh, sort of um, the, the, the different narratives of scale that, take, that are taking place and unfolding on the island. So um, whereas these pylons are used uh, to reclaim the land again, um, an image like this um, talks about the, um, the kind of everyday life on the island. Um, this is the playground. Um, with the, in the 1950s, 60s, you had these cement slides. I don't think you have them. In, in the US or <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting structure. I, I remember in Lahore, in Model Town, I'm sure, Will, you must have seen these slides. You know, in, in the public parks, you still have cement slides made out of concrete cement, which are polished so that, you know, you can actually slide down them. Um, so these slides I found in a playground, you know, walking from the pier towards the beach on the island, I would pass them every time. and. One day, they were gone. So I'm glad I took some images of, of these slides, um, which were kind of in ruins. And you would find little kids climbing up and sliding down them. Uh, I'm glad they were demolished. But this image also just you know, in relationship to something like this, it's the coexistence of these kinds of structures that I'm very interested in, um, you know, that kind of res represent something more than just the, the um, the, the 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 object itself um, titled uh, building terrain um, this is um, a construction which um, which came out of um, an almanac which I found in the in the menorah observatory and I'll show you some images of um, the advertisements in those almanacs and then perhaps come back to this um, the Durbin wala on the right um, you have these um, um, on Friday afternoons. You have you can pay twenty rupees and uh, step on a little platform and see the horizon through this homemade telescope. Um, 
So it's 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 this is what people go there for. You know, they pay thirty rupees on a boat. They take a picnic, take their family, and sit on the beach. And you know, through the doorbeen, through the telescope, you see the horizon, which you can't see in the city at all because it's so built up. And in the urban, you know, jungle that it is, sometimes you just can't see where the sky meets the land. And I think this is a a wonderful sort of experience. Um, and I, th I and I think both these images are beginning to make you know sense of what I'm trying to access out of this work, this body of work, um, and um, so just going back to this, the way that the work has evolved very intuitively, um, and the way that I've documented this process. It's not just been through photography and video, but I've been working on drawings, um, and. Uh, uh, um, proposals for installations that are in my mind, large-scale installations. Um, there's a myth which is very important, and it it I did I sort of found out about it very early on in my um, research on Menorah, and that myth is about um, it's a poem in uh, Shah Abdul Latif Bhattai's uh, Risalo, um, and it's a it's a poem about a fisherman. Uh, Mururio, Maridio, who um, goes out with his brothers. In fact, he doesn't go out. His brothers go out um, into the sea, um, and they get killed by a whale shark. So he builds a glass capsule. And this, uh, this epic poem was written around the mid-18th century. So the idea that the poet envisioned uh, a, a, a glass capsule was extraordinary for me. And I started thinking about building my own very, very large um, glass fossil capsule in which Mururio might have gone down into the ocean to rescue his brothers. And these were some of the um, proposal drawings that I had for a possible installation on the island or elsewhere. So um, the archive was. Um, the archive idea really began to um, uh, develop over a period of, after having five years of, of photographic documentation of the island, I started thinking not in terms of single images or uh, sculptures, but really, really in terms of um, a, a much larger uh, body of work. And also just in order to um, develop the, the links between the different approaches in the work, uh, the drawings, uh, the, the video work, the photographs, and the sculptures, but also just to um, create, a, sort of show the clusters of ideas, the different ideas that had evolved in, um, in this process. And I was lucky to um, participate in the Shanghai Biennale, which opened last October in Shanghai. And I have a space in which I could um, present the archive in its first edition, I suppose, and I hope that um, you know. I hope that uh, I, I mean, it's an ongoing process. It's a very ongoing process. I don't think that um, the archive in this um, presentation was uh, is the way it's going to be next year or even by the end of this year. And I think it was also uh, because I was. Um, I wanted to really kind of create a discursive system where people would be able to hopefully ask questions um, and and find, um, you know, just be able to read the images rather than look at them as individual objects. So um, the well, one of the clusters um, really had to do with the notion of time. Um, and how I experience time on Menorah Island, because that's one of the um, n that's one of the concerns. I mean, after after going back and forth between the city and this other space, I really felt that my relationship to how I experienced um, the island was to do with the way that you could really get um, get a sense of deep time uh, in that space, and so um, these clusters. Um, on the walls of, of the paintings and the photographs or the sculpture, you know, became a way to uh, place a lot of the work um, and also to select and edit a lot of the work that had accumulated. 
Um, this is um, an oil painting and um, detail of, of larger work. The, um, the image on the top right is, um, is an image of um, cadets being inspected by the, the naval commodore in combat uniform. And um, the, the lower black and white image is something I shot uh, of the Dhobi Ghat in Manor Island. So the uniforms uh, being washed and the linen being washed and spread out to dry. Um, it, there's probably about 40 years uh, between these two sets of photographs. Uh, but it was just the way that it came together that I thought was, was important and interesting. Um, and um, the idea of the snow globe um, has been reoccurring in my work um, for um, the last two years. And it's been, it's been interesting because um, thinking about, um, about um, you know, going to a place where you find a souvenir, what do you pick up when you go to an, a new city or a new, new country? You pick up a snow globe and uh, you take it home. You bring it back to your own space. And I thought about what kind of snow globe I could create for Menorah Island. And it was a, a real conflict because I couldn't, I couldn't you know, think what would, be the, what would be the kind of space that could be represented, pre representative. And so it was a mixture of the shark, the whale shark from the myth, a mixture of some of the architectural sort of um, buildings that I'd been photographing, as well as just these small small souvenirs that you pick up um, on the island. And I'll show you some images of those. But um, I would, I, w I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, the second idea, in a sense, is the idea of landscape as, as a witness um, to the changing and shifting um, space. And um, I think I could perhaps show this a short video now um, which um, which I can play. And this is um, the observatory, um, which was shot very recently and edited. It's um, It was the weather observatory on Menorah Island, which I found. And when they unlocked the building, um, the keeper of the observatory realized that um, that it had, uh, the roof had collapsed. Um, within the building, I found um, a lot of paperwork uh, from 1916 onwards, uh, tide tables of the Indian Ocean, um, manuals that basically documented the tidal movement of the Karachi Harbor, uh, which was a very important function of the observatory. Um, but more than that, I think this video became an important opening for me into a much larger geography, um, which was um, the geography of British India. Um, so should I just um, just minimize this for a second and perhaps play this um, six minute video? Dakora, Dante, 31st January, heavy hail song, being dead. Storm lasted 90 minutes. Many cattle and birds came. Corn Court District, 1st March, afternoon. Hail storm. Damage to crops. Hundreds of birds killed. Amritsar, Hisar. Gurgaon, Laipur district, 5th March, hailstorm, crops of wheat, senti, chaktal, and toria destroyed. Dodar, Chota Nagpur, 5th March, hailstorm, 1 dead, 11 head of cattle and large number of birds killed. Dibrugar, Assam. 12th March, evening, hailstorm. Several houses collapsed, trees uprooted, electric wires damaged. Silhet, 
Assam, 17th March, 100 sports, 1,000 square miles affected, train held up. Colombo, 29th March, 9th, thunderstorm, several districts lying in darkness, 400 telephones out of action. Mysore district, 6th March, thunderstorm, one dead, two huts burned down by lightning, two cars and two boats hit. Mehalpur Nadia, 6th May, gale, three dead, many houses demolished, mango jackfruit and lychee crops damaged. Calcutta, 7th May, evening, nor'wester thunderstorm, first nor'wester of the year, temperature fell by 18 degrees, wind velocity reached 74 miles per hour, overhead electric cables blown down, Tolligan, Hora, and Kosapur plunged in darkness. Country craft capsized and sank in the Hooghly. Siliguri, North Bengal, 20th May, morning, thunderstorm, one dead. Three coolies working in the Bagdadra sea estate struck by lightning. One of them died. Chittagong, 13th May, night, thunderstorm. Two dead, one severely burnt. Viramgaon, Ahmedabad, 31st May, night, gale, one dead, one seriously injured, several buildings damaged. Purnia, 4th June, night, gale, rain, damage to mango crops. Motor bus smashed by tree falling over it. Jhansi, 5th June, dust storm. A falling tree injured the driver of the Tonga and his passenger. Lahore, 5th June, evening, dust storm. Two planes of the Northern India Flying Club carried away. One managed to land near the aerodrome. The other made a forced landing elsewhere. Sakhar, 10th June, evening, dust storm. Several huts blown away. People injured by electric wire snapping. Tents blown away. Darjeeling, 20th June, evening, gale and rain, one dead. A landslide injured some people. Munshigan, Bengal, 12th July, night, day, six dead. A boat capsized at the junction of two rivers. Dhaka, 19th August, midnight, day. Three boats laden with palm sank. Jamalpur, Namansen, 3rd September, evening, gale, four dead, ferry boat capsized in Jamalpur. Lahore, 12th September, morning, gale, one dead. Indian National Airways plane Beechcraft crashed 30 miles from Lahore. Pilot killed. So um, the um, 
This was really um, a sort of um, visual e excavation for me. Um, but also at the same time, it was a way to reconstruct the evidence that was in front of me in this, um, in this, um, in this building. And I think that was, um, I, if, uh, that was a very interesting space to work with because it was um, neither, it was kind of opening. It was a, it was a in-between kind of space uh, where the building itself was not complete but rather through the kind of ruin and detritus, I felt that I could find um, a new construction of what I was wanting to create. Um, and I, I felt this at many points of working in Manora, that the fact that Manora is not what it was and not it hasn't as yet become something, I think that's one of the reasons that I find the space very porous and um, easier to engage with. Um, but really, in terms of the observatory, um, I felt that it was like an apparatus through which I was um, kind of seeing a, a kind of expanded optics. I think um, the 1939 weather review was a very important discovery. And just to open up, the, um, to open up that small um, a review uh, finding that um, it contained all the hur hurricanes and storms that uh, were um, were um, put together during British India, and just the classification of those storms in terms of the framework, um, the the date, the city, how many creatures were killed, whether they were birds or human beings and uh, so on. So that kind of classification and the structure of it imposed on top of a very, very um, chaotic kind of space was, was also an interesting contrast. Um, but more than that, I realized um, only after this mapping um, or this kind of coming together happened was just the way that um, it opened the geography. I mean, from this very, very small island and this building which ha nobody's really opened for many years, you know, you kind of had this space of, or geography of many different points in the map suddenly becoming a very evocative space. Um, while we were editing and Nimra Bocha, who uh, did the narration, um, we asked my mother-in-law to come up and give us some help in the pronunciation of some of these cities because, you know, the, the, the names have changed just the way that the British um, pronounce it or the way that uh, a local Indian would pronounce it, the way that a weather, uh, uh, you know, a weather person would say it in the news would be all very different. And I realized that um, a place like Siliguri or Darjeeling, you know, suddenly had a very, very um, large significance for her because she said Siliguri is a place where we took the toy train to Darjeeling. So there was a toy train from Siliguri to Darjeeling. Now, I mean, we didn't know any of this. So suddenly the, those points in the map became a very, very important place um, and, you know, held a kind of whole um, untapped source of memories for her. And I realized that perhaps somebody sitting at Kol Kolkata or Dhaka who would see this would suddenly realize Lahore, Karachi, Sakhar, you know, all of these points in the map that they didn't have access to now necessarily or easy access to would suddenly become, um, you know, a well of, of personal experience. Um, so this um, very simple uh, documentation of the space or reconstruction of what, what for me, what I was trying to do in the observatory was really, really reconstruct the space through the editing of, of the material that I, I, I filmed. Um, and, and really to sort of bring together the walls and the debris and you know ev all the ingredients that had made up the building uh, in 1898 when it was built um, to its current state. I, I felt that it was just, it was all there in the building, but it was just had to be reconfigured um, back into place. Um, so coming back to the archive, this um, the observatory is really an important component of the archive and um, and so is this drawing, which uh, is titled Merry Go Round. It's quite a large drawing. And um, it, uh, it works, uh, again, 
I, I think even something which is observed and drawn suddenly begins to translate into something more. And a number of um, the objects on the merry-go-round were not actually there, but objects which I um, began to imagine within that drawing. So the whale, for example, was, was something that shadow that I placed inside the merry-go-round. And these are um, sculptures with, that were also part of the um, uh, archive and placed in relationship to um, each other. So um, I'm going to move a little faster because I know that there is not much time. And I would li love to have some um, you know, discussion about this from, from all of you. Um, the, the small objects in Menorah are um, uh, but th these are objects that I've made in brass. They're objects cast from, from f uh, found. Um, the Sipighar on the left, the shell house, is actually a small souvenir that you can buy in Menorah Manor Island. But in the process of casting it, again, I wanted to open it up and reconfigure the structure of it so that I could think about how um, something can be changed or altered. Um, in that process of um, re re reconstructing it. So th these were physical <laughs> manifestations of my kind of interventions in, in quite small objects, but the idea was important for me. And um, the map um, and the terrain and the building of terrain, I mean, building terrain, I think two things are important. M the map has started to become more and more important. But out of that map, what is it that's growing out? Uh, it's not just the built structures, but it's other kinds of imaginings. And um, this, again, uh, in Shanghai, I placed a very large watercolor and started to place the objects on top of the tables. And I realized that um, you know, this is the kind of terrain that I would, I'd like to think about and work with uh, in the coming months. Uh, just a photograph to show you where some of these objects are, f are bought on the island. So this is a small um, um, uh, sort of table with all of these 20, 30 rupee sippi ghars being sold by this little boy. And in the background, the sort of ruin of a very relatively new structure, the one of the KPT um, buildings where sort of junior officers might, might live, might have lived, uh, which are all now covered with graffiti, as you can see. And, and these are some of the objects that are bought on the island. So I've been collecting these objects, and I've found the kind of iconography. I mean, the, the making of the object has changed a lot over the last five years, and um, they've become more high tech. Um, <laughs> this is like the Spanish Armada on the left, and a small boat in the middle, which has the Kaaba in it. The center image has a little shrine, uh, the green roof of a shrine, and the Kaaba. So, you know, unusual things are happening on these boats, and also in the shells. You, and in, actually, in some of them, you have little mice. And then in these ones, you, again, you have the Kaaba and the, 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 the dome of a, of a mosque or a shrine. So how and where these objects are, um, you know, who's actually making the decisions to m make them like this? I'm not sure. But they're made, some of them are made on the island by women or on the mainland in Karachi. And there's, there's a constant stream of, of, um, of things that are sold. And out of these little objects, I started to make these objects, which are accumulations of found uh, and broken toys, um, which are then cast in brass and welded together. Um, and I worked uh, with a, in an artisanal community in Golimar in Karachi, making and casting these objects. Um, so that in, in itself was quite an experience and you know, food for thought and um, more, more interesting to be in that space than the work I was doing in it, I think. And I, 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 was, yeah, I, was, I, was, I was really enjoying that process and the kids coming in. You know, this is not the kind of usual work that they do in Golimar. So people were intrigued to see me sitting in one of the welding shops. And you know, it's that kind of, you're, you're crossing a space, you're crossing a line as a woman and also in terms of class there's a huge you know sort of stepping over which um is very very um uh, obvious and and uh, um just coming back 
to show you the images um, found in the observatory building and the almanac. So these were some of the adverts, which are in the beginning, adverts selling communication equipment. Um, and these almanacs date back to the late 50s, early 60s. So it's sort of post Second World War, post uh, you know independence of India and Pakistan, and you have these really um, you have all the high tech sophisticated equipment being sold uh, back to us um, by by Great Britain and and possibly other um, countries, and I, I think it's in a sense interesting because we are still buying the <laughs> the technology to um, to kill each other. <laughs> Um, within our own space, but uh, the 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 Marconi, um, the second from the the right is the image which I took um, the template. But recently, I'm really intrigued by the one on the extreme right, vision and position, um, because in a, in a sense, I mean, it's very much um, about just even my position here and me showing you my work at this point. We were having a conversation a few days ago about um, me bringing my work and showing it to audiences in the US, the Broad Museum exhibition. And uh, I, I really felt that, yes, it's, it's all about how everything is read. Um, talking about this work in Karachi University or in Lahore at LUMS was a very different experience because um, it's, it's, a, it's a different um, there's a different knowledge pool and a different physical experience of, of the city and the country and, and um, current politics. And obviously, um, here it's in the US, it's, it's completely different. But vision and position and how it changes, you know, wh what your position, how your geographical location changes the way that you're viewing and reading something is, is, is quite um, significant. But just to quickly, you know, show you this, the, the template that came out of the advert, and and how I'm using it now in in some of the images that I'm making. And I was intrigued by the the way that the the large sea vessels in the Marconi ad, you know, are really large, and in the in the smaller loop you have this little tiny plane coming in. And again, this is I suppose the end of the the supremacy of sea power and the beginning of uh, you know air power that was taking over post s sort of second world war and um, well some of my uh, again all of this was shown in the menorah archive in shanghai and um, these are small drawings in my sketchbook which are working towards uh, sculptures that i made um, subsequently these constellations of random um, objects which are connected together like clusters. And, um, and then these boats, these brass boats, which are also on these, um, on these uh, stands, um, like the telescopes on the beach in Manora. Um, well, I could show you a few minutes of this, but I think you'll probably go, hopefully if you go to the Broad Museum over the next three months, you'll see this video. Um, in which I painted um, the, f the furniture in a demolished uh, schoolyard where three kids had died under a wall because, you know, they hit a football against the wall and it collapsed on, on three small kids. So uh, the school site, the school was demolished. But in the center of this demolition site, I found uh, piles of furniture uh, which I painted uh, with the help of some of the people who came to watch me. And um, the video just has these sort of random conversations about politics and religion and, and sort of trying to earn a living. So very mundane and quite sort of blah. <laughs> but at the same time, it had a kind of sense of, um, I think, again, just mar for me, it was a, a homage, a title is homage, but it was about marking the terrain again. Um, well, this brings me to the, the final sort of few paintings in, um, that I've been working on. And um, um, Between the Temple and the Playground was really the first um, oil painting. Um, and I, I decided a, a year or so ago that I really wanted to um, not stretch my work out, but try and bring it in and, and really work within a tighter um, format somehow. 
um, and and perhaps a more traditional process um, like oil painting, which I hadn't come back to for many years. Um, and I felt that it was a challenge to try to uh, work within one process, one medium, and really try and um, think about the possibilities of, of, of representation as well, how I would be able to talk about the concerns and the outcomes, um, and, and working and engaging in a landscape um, through, through this one singular process. So this painting was really quite important for me, and um, it, uh, it sort of um, enabled me to think about stretching um, my work and, and um, oh, this is another one. And, and, and really, it began with these two photographs, a series of photographs which were shot in Menorah a couple of years back. And um, it was kind of a sense of how you, know, you had this sense of dual time existing on the island, um, where the landscape held a certain sense of time and, and um, the way that um, these women kind of Almost, it's like an intervention in the image for me. You know how they how they carry a different sense of time, um, and um, so this is a detail of that. Um, yeah, and so the sort of sense of how um, I could look at um, landscape, you know, as as a kind of al almost uh, a mythical experience was important in this case, and. Um, the, so this large painting, which I came back to oil painting after 15 years, uh, and I stretched a canvas which was about nine feet by seven feet on my studio wall, uh, and I, I, I sort of jumped into a deep, to the into the deep water in a sense, um, and really struggled. But it led to a number of paintings, which um, which I'll share with you. Um, and I think also these paintings brought me closer to the the city and the landscape of the city. Um, and um, well, the idea of the map, as I was saying earlier, has become more and more important. Um, started um, looking at some historical maps of Karachi, all of which were probably uh, configured by the British, and this is before partition. Um, and I've been trying to think about my own relationship to how I experience the city. And I think um, perhaps looking at uh, these maps, I was trying to, over a period of um, a couple of months, I started working on a number of small watercolors, small paintings, which all talked about me trying to enter into the space of the city and thinking about the kind of maps that I would would like to make. Um, so, um, looking at the city as a as a um, as a as a sort of um, internal in a, in a more internal sort of way. I've put in these images because these are some of the things that we've been experiencing in the city, the kind of disrupted geography that um, I've sort of talked about, um, and the kind of constant social upheaval that makes um, life quite unpredictable sometimes um, and unstoppable at the same time. Um, But really, at the same time, um, it's the it's the way that um, all of these changes change, changes are sort of transforming uh, the space. Um, and this brings me to the last uh, two paintings that um, will be shown at the Broad Museum. Um, Karachi, past, present, and future. And this is not a this is not a shot of the complete image. I kind of worked on it a little more after this image was taken. Um, 
I found myself over a year drawing and redrawing the map. Um, and then in September, the headlines on the local newspaper, on a local newspaper was uh, Karachi's map redrawn. Um, and this was obviously in a more political context in terms of uh, the political parties trying to redraw the map in order to you know, have more control over the city. Uh, and that's really part of one of the significant part of one of the, the, the conflicts that one constantly experiences is the turf war that um, is going on between different political parties. And I, I, I kind of felt um, that me painting, redrawing, repainting the map on this canvas was so, sort of, um, I, I, I didn't feel so frustrated after eight months of just redrawing the map because uh, it, was, it was an interesting parallel to what was actually happening uh, in that political space. Um, and the furniture, which really sort of floats up or rains down, I'm not sure exactly which way um, to look at it at the moment, um, is, is like a sort of membrane. It's, it's the furniture from Menorah Island, from, from that uh, small school uh, site. And I, th I think it's, well, it's more of a metaphor, really, uh, rather than anything else about the, the, um, the sort of uh, other reality and, and another kind of um, experience of, of the city. Um, these images were shot in 2010. Um, I'm sure the space is completely transformed by now. But it's uh, taken from a bridge, Korangi Bridge, which takes you to an industrial hub, one of the industrial sites, uh, Korangi Industrial Area of Karachi, which is very close to where I live. Um, and I really liked, um, I, well, this photograph is interesting. Um, recently, I was reading something by Arif Hassan Saab, who's an urban scholar, urban planner, um, in which he writes about um, in the 80s, um, there were these sort of open marshlands within the city where you, you know, cattle would graze, and 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 it, reading that, I I felt, and obviously those areas have completely disappeared, but this is probably the kind of space that um, you know existed around the city in in many pockets of of its um, of of its um, uh, location, and and you have the city as as it grows. And and so the sort of last painting, which will be at the broad as well, um, I think I was trying to again create the terrain in a very vertical stacked kind of format. So the map, as well as this painting, were really happening simultaneously. And, um, and uh, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop at this point. I think we can probably talk a little bit rather than me talking. Um, but I, I hope that, um, I mean, I think one of the uh, things that I hope is that um, I hope the work operates really as a way to access a different kind of narrative of Pakistan that's not really very visible in the West. Um, I think um, the more dominant narratives are about um, the instability and the drone strikes and the war on terror, but um, I think just to be able to see how um, artists are making work um, is a different entry point into what may be familiar to you on a particular level. Thank you. Sure. Sure. I'll put the lights on. Um. Just a second. Oh. <laughs> Didn't show you the last two images. Oh. Sorry. It's all right. It's not a problem. Um, no, it's just the whale shark that <laughs> oh, is this a came to the this harbor. Is a beached whale? Is this, uh, this is a beached whale. Yes. Okay. Um, and um, it's um, well. There was this is this is this one was about about 150 pounds. No, no tons. <laughs> yeah, bigger. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> tons. <laughs> um, <laughs> and 
And it surfaced, um, well, it, it was beached in the harbor. And you know, again, uh, this was February 2012, I think. And um, you know, it's, it's just uh, incredible. I got calls from emails from friends across the world saying, Niza, your whale shark <laughs> from the, has returned, yes. A uh, Morurio, Morurio, yes. <laughs> so. I really enjoyed looking at your work and moreover just hearing you think through um, a kind of encounter, you know, with a place and making sense of it. And, I, and I'm glad you sort of ended with the last painting because one of the things that I had been thinking, listening to you, knowing you a little bit, um, knowing Karachi a little bit or at least as a, you know, kind of foreign scholar, um, that I, in all the work of Menorah, I feel like there's Karachi is present there the whole way through, despite its very, very different material culture from the city that's, you know, onshore. And then in the end, the whale comes to Karachi. In a way, Menorah lands back up and yes. is superimposed over the map of the city. And I just wondered whether you'd want to talk about that or, because in a way, I, it's, I see the um, Menorah project being very much engaged with this bigger, more chaotic, and yet still very fractured and fragmentary and disjunctive city of Karachi right nearby, in a way, the thing that pushed you out, but you also keep going back to it somewhere. Hmm. It's not a real question, other than would you reflect yeah, on it's, the, it's just the city just on shore from Menorah? Yeah, I think um, it's. It's what you're saying uh, is, is, is very much, um, it's really important. I, I feel that um, I've been, I mean, my, my work in Menorah has, has been like a kind of a way to observe the city from a little bit of distance. I think it's very difficult to make sense of the city when you're right in the middle of it and having to deal and struggle with things on a, on a daily basis. And I don't think I could have produced or had this uh, entry point into the city if I hadn't stepped away from it slightly. I mean, it's just that slight in a sense. It's um, And it's been like a sentry post for me. Uh, it's, it's been like I've been looking with a durbin and thinking about Karachi constantly over this time and the parallels that I constantly come across. And I, I discover something in Menorah which is a relatively... Uh, easier point of access. It's a more porous space. And I start thinking about the multi-religious space. And I think, well, Karachi is ridden with, you know, temples. And I wonder, you know, how many have been, you know, where are they? And start to look for them and the churches and the cemeteries and, you know, everything. So it's almost like you have to excavate the city. I, I mean, I want to excavate the city now. I mean, that is how I want to sort of go through this um, but um, the whale surfacing again, I, and a month ago, there was another whale shark that was found in the harbor just two weeks ago. Um, so it's it's really it's really strange how yeah I mean this whole phenomenon of the beach whale and the I, the metaphor of the beached whale is is something to think about in that context. Yeah. Um, Thank you. That is, I think, that is absolutely beautiful. Um, you talked a little about, you talked a lot actually about time as being one of the things which was um, you were exploring through your work, and um, you talked about stretched and compressed time specifically. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of locate some more luck ruptures, perhaps, in your concept of time, because um, one sense that I got as I was as seeing the progression of your work from Nora Archive back down back to Karachi was also um, and especially in the observa um, observatory, the, the, the little documentary that you made, uh, was that there was a sense of foreclosure of opportunities, I think, or some, some sort of foreclosure. I wasn't sure of what um, in the more recent time. And you also made a brief comment about how um, ruins, you know, the more recent ruins are more bleak somehow um, than those in the past in the lighthouse and, um, and, um, and the other two, the observatory and the third, I can't remember which. Um, so do you, um, 
and also how time so, so somehow seems to move faster now in a way in which you um, you know you showed a picture from two years ago uh, it may or may not the, the landscape may have changed so is there also some other ruptures that you're trying to you know perhaps uh, recover or try and you know go back to something um, in time perhaps yeah I think um, it's it's about this sort of idea of um, time coexist different time temporalities coexisting um, which I experience in Manora constantly and and they are visible or or they are sort of manifested in in the build structures and to some extent um, the 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 newer ruins they do seem more bleak and more ravaged which is really odd it's something I felt very early on uh, more than the temple or the lighthouse I think probably because the temple, the lighthouse, the church have just been left, or maybe um, because they're still in use, but they still have a function. Um, but it's um, it's it's that one is, you know, with every bend as as you walk from the Kimar from the civilian pier, you know, you you sort of experience the KPT blocks, which are all marked for demolition, and you know, it's it's. It's um, for the last four or five years they haven't demolished them, uh, so it, it's a strange sense of um, that space. Then you turn a corner and suddenly you see the sparkly white, um, you know, footpath of the naval uh, as you enter the naval area, which you have to walk through in order to get to the public beach. So it's this. This is the rupture and this is the kind of disjuncture of of one's experience that every turn and every corner, it just changes, it shifts, and you're suddenly you know, thrown into another kind of experience of the, of, of the physical space. And I think that experience um, also you know, creates that kind of changing of gear, I suppose, Im mentally. Um, but I think it's, um, it's, it's this, um, I, I, I find that, um, I, I find the in-between space of the island is is what allows me to access these different uh, levels of um, experiencing space, experiencing time. So so um, that's not something that you can access in the city in Karachi. Um, partly due to the fact that we have a very sort of compressed and um, kind of severely compressed. Um, you know, schedule and experience of what we are doing. And there's no space for reflection. That's the biggest problem. There's just no space to step away emotionally and physically and to reflect on, on what's happening around you. That is the, that's the, that's the kind of reality that one, exp you know, goes through. One proper answer to my question is it's totally irrelevant, and if you choose to say that, I'll respect you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that makes it sound scarier than it should be. Um, so you located your present work in relationship to some of your past work and some of yourself, and I can see quite a bit of the person there, even if you've moved from the personal and the bodily to this other kind of thing. And then you've located your work in relationship to its places, whether it's you know, British India or the island off of Karachi and all of the places in between. But I wonder if you would care to locate your work in relation to an or several art worlds, uh, other artists, other styles, other formal features, just things you just didn't mention at all. Yeah, you know. sure. Um. Well, I, I think, yeah, as an artist, I'm living in a very globalized space, and um, so access to other kinds of art worlds is, is quite quite fluid. Um, but in terms of um, artists that, um, I mean, there have been so many influences and interests over the years. I yeah, I, I certainly, I mean, uh, I think f perhaps during the figurative sort of um, uh, time period, uh, I was looking, I really enjoyed the work of Marlene Dumas, for example. She's an artist, uh, 
Dutch South African artist, Marlene Dumas, um, who works with the body and is whose work is very interesting and quite quirky. Um, gosh. Um, more recently, I think I've just been accessing a lot more urban theory and um, you know work actually, which is not so much in the art world. Um, and I find that has really, really given a lot of um, given me a lot of um, information and and knowledge. And so it's sort of, um, but um, within um, South Asia, I mean, even looking at um, uh, artists like uh, Anju Dodia, for example, I really enjoy her work. Um, um, and earlier on, sort of in the 90s, looking at artists like Nancy Spiro and um, Kiki Smith. Um, so, I mean, those are some of the, the people that I've really enjoyed looking at. I can, I can go on and on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Movement, uh, yes. Oh yeah, William Kentridge. Yes, I mean he's. Yeah. Thanks. Um, seeing your images makes me think of uh, the island of Kish, which is Iranian, and it was developed before the revolution to be a kind of Disneyland but it became aborted. And you see all these dystopic imageries of um, merry-go-rounds and casinos that are left dilapidated, but you have archeological sites and uh, Iranian tourists who come because they can get duty-free you know, goods from Germany and so on. So it, it, you have all this layering. And when I go to a place like that, I think of it um, in terms of aborted projects and mel uh, sort of nostalgia, melancholia, um, overpopulation, uneven development. And in a sense, then, I think of it in really critical terms. And in your discussion of menorah and your ruminations on uh, time and space, I'm wondering whether your work also is intended as uh, maybe overt or covert critique of urbanization, uneven development, um, the loss of uh, natural life. In a way, if I were a curator, I would maybe read into it and I would write labels about it like that, but I don't know if that's what you're intending. So is there an activist component to your work? Well, I think um, definitely there is, a, there is a more critical approach. Um, and I, I would like the work to be read in that sense. It's not an, uh, a nostalgic journey through uh, the space and, and recording the ruins of, of a particular uh, space. Um, I think all of these things that you've mentioned um, resonate out of um, the kinds of um, engagement conversations that I've had um, on the island. Uh, with other uh, people on the, about menorah itself, and also I think that um, you know I felt I feel very strongly that um, in a sense menorah is is really like a microcosm of what um, what Karachi is going through and what it has in terms of its urbanization, in terms of um, its um, sort of um, failed projects as well as a mega city and what it attempts to do for its citizens. Uh, so those um, those those um, those issues are very important because we are living there, and it's something that you experience constantly. You know, you're you're kind of the recipient of uh, a lot of the um, mismanagement of 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 governance as well as city planning, as well as politics and 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 everything else that's going on. So definitely, I I feel that you know there are a lot of um, outcomes which are not necessarily um, articulated by myself, but which which you can read into. And I I I feel that um, I feel that it's 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 quite um, problematic sometimes to um, place the work constantly and immediately into a political. Um, framework, because that's not the only impetus of the work itself. 
And I think it's it's it is easy to go that way and that has been done and it's it has been kind of framed that way, which is not a problem for me. Um because I agree with a lot of what 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 uh, that discussion um entails. But I always feel that especially with the figurative work, I feel that um, just to say that this is, an, you know, the, the subversiveness of working with the female body or the nude within the context is often uh, the the only thing that's that's um, discussed. Whereas there are sort of many other issues uh, to do with, you know, myself as a woman, as an artist, which perhaps get overshadowed by the political sort of interpretations of the work. And as I was saying it at lunch, you know, it's it's uh, the questions that w we face um, as as artists uh, living in Pakistan are always um, quite linear. And um, one would um, one interesting question was how do you um, how do you engage with your male um, artists in a living in a in a in a Muslim society? And you know, my answer is I hang out with them just like you do <laughs> in an in a in a in a society here it's it's the, the preconceptions sometimes can be quite ridiculous maybe i can take the prerogative to ask a final question which comes to me on the basis of what you just said which is i'm going to guess that in the international fora in which you circulate you are likely often asked the question of what it means to be, always with the subtext of how it constrains you to yep. be Muslim, to yeah. be a woman in Pakistan, to be a Pakistani artist. And I guess just for argument's mm. sake, I want to ask a different question. I want to turn that on its head. What, if anything, is really liberating about being an artist based in Pakistan today and working from that and choosing to work from that as um, from that site? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd say that it's um, extremely exciting to be working in Pakistan. I think um, this kind of, I mean, it's a very, it, it is a very, um, it's, a, it's a quite a struggle, but at the same time, the space is so fertile and the engagement is so, so exciting. Um, and there's really a lot happening and um, not just in the contemporary art space, but otherwise. Um, so one is constantly challenged to interpret that space. Uh, but something I didn't mention earlier on, um, which was really the fact that um, being an artist, I feel that I've, and, and that is the advantage of being a woman and an artist uh, living in Pakistan, I feel like I've gotten under the radar of the establishment. I mean, a lot of the work that I've done in Manora, I could not have been able to do um, because um, I've not been a threat to the establishment. So for example, um, at the NED, uh, a lot of the um, architecture professors, um, a few last year, you know, said, OK, you have an archive on Manora. Can we see it? Because they had been trying to get access to Manora to photograph some of the historical sites, but they were not being given permission by the Navy or the KPT. And so, um, you know, I felt, and this is something I, I, I talked about, I really felt that I'd gotten under the radar. And being able to photograph and, you know, get to places, and, and uh, it was a little bit like, uh, sort of innocent espionage, <laughs> but, you know, I wasn't using it uh, in any any sort of bad way. I was using it to, 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 you know, to basically document, and a lot of that material is still lying there. It hasn't been shown. So uh, the advantage is huge, being a woman, um, and the constraint that a lot of uh, people might uh, imagine um, is something, I mean, you you have an advantage being a woman. You there's a lot of respect and you're not, um, you know, they, they won't hassle you perhaps or they, you know, you take out a sketchbook when you have two big cameras hanging around your neck and you're saying, but I'm just drawing, you know, here, look at my drawing. And so they leave you alone thinking, you know, this is, this won't be too much of a problem. But it is, it is, um, you know, otherwise it's quite tough sometimes if you're a man. <laughs> and uh, so 
it's 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 been an I've used it to my advantage I think more and more I'm sort of taking that uh, that view trying to subvert my position